So it's a delight and honor to be here with you today. As an expeditionary scientist, I'm preoccupied with studying life in its extremes. Modern humans have become so adept at constructing cities and societies with highly controlled environments that we sometimes take for granted the relative ease of our existence on this planet, let alone in our backyard, the solar system. And yet, we can find life in myriad forms thriving in parts of our planet that are quite demanding, if inhospitable, to the human body. Humans are mesophiles. We like things to be just right for our bodies in rather temperate conditions, or we find it very difficult to function. In my research, I investigate life that exists in extreme conditions and the humans that are able to live and work in these otherwise inhospitable environments. As for myself, I'm happier when I'm able to spend time driving my Land Cruiser or my Rover on the gorgeous, vast interior desert regions of Australia, studying sturdy halophiles. Or descending into lava tubes in Hawaii to look for organisms that thrive in a world of complete darkness. Or my favorite, sailing for days across the Drake Passage to explore Antarctica and study the impact of climate change on our precious seventh continent. In 2021, I had the privilege of working with the crew of Inspiration4, the first crew entirely comprised of private citizens to orbit the Earth in SpaceX's Dragon capsule. These four brave individuals were able to show that space is a frontier that can be open to so many more of us if given the opportunity. The great news is the crew of Inspiration4 who flew at an altitude of 585 kilometers above the Earth for nearly three days, returned to Earth happy and healthy and wanting to go back. If we look to the future of space exploration, what are the challenges that humans will face? Thankfully, we have over 60 years of research studying the hundreds of professional astronauts who've flown through their national program to orbit. The turn towards civilian crews and privately funded missions has led to the start of a new space era that is led by a burgeoning and ambitious commercial space sector. The International Space Station has hosted astronauts for over 20 years. The station orbits above the Earth at an altitude of approximately 400 kilometers and must travel at 28,000 kilometers per hour in order to maintain its position. That means that the astronauts on ISS orbit around the Earth once every 90 minutes and will experience 16 sunrises for every one of our days back on the surface of the Earth. Most astronauts stay aboard the ISS a number of months or over a year. But what we know of biological studies of these astronauts shows uh, what we can expect uh, from our time in low Earth orbit and how our body changes. It's very common for astronauts on any flight to experience motion sickness that leads to a lingering headache and nausea, very much like we experience vertigo in space or on Earth. <laughs> Medication can be provided, but not everyone will experience space sickness or want to be medicated as it can produce unwanted side effects. Without gravity, our body fluids pool towards the upper part of our body. The face becomes puffy. And some uh, astronauts report feeling stuffy-headed, like you would if you had a cold or seasonal allergies. As this fluid builds within the head, one's sense of smell and taste becomes diminished, making it more difficult for you to savor your food, but better at coping with other less pleasant smells that may be aboard the station. The more time you spend in low Earth orbit and low gravity, the weaker your muscles and bones will become and your cardiovascular system won't function nearly as well as it does on Earth. Radiation poses significant risk to astronauts as it can form reactive species that damage cells and the DNA within them. Most astronauts have only ever traveled in low Earth orbit, which extends all the way out to 2,000 kilometers beyond our surface. To journey to the moon, we'll have to leave behind the protection of the Earth's magnetosphere, 
and pass through two regions filled with charged particles captured from the solar wind known as the Van Allen Belt. Thankfully, the journey through the Van Allens, taken by various crews of the Apollo missions, showed us that they were exposed to a very small amount of radiation owing to the brief time they spent in transit through them. Let's move on to the moon, our beloved satellite. The last humans that walked on the surface of the moon were the crew of Apollo 17 in 1972. There's every reason to believe that a new generation of astronauts will walk on the moon by the end of this decade. What conditions do these explorers need to prepare for? Thankfully, the moon does have a gravitational pull of its own, though it's only a fraction of Earth's gravity. This will help mitigate some of the problems our bodies have coping with the lack of gravity in space. One complete cycle of day and night on the moon takes approximately 28 days, or 14 days of sunlight and 14 days of darkness. So short duration missions will need to plan accordingly in order to ensure that the astronauts arrive with the best conditions for their mission. And those who spend any appreciable amount of time uh, will need to expect long periods of darkness followed by long periods of intense sunlight. Because there's no atmosphere, radiation levels on the moon are much higher. Charged particles like galactic cosmic rays contribute to an overall dose of radiation that is 2.6 times higher for astronauts on the moon compared to their colleagues aboard the ISS in low Earth orbit. Special protection will be needed in the rare case of a solar flare that sends an intense burst of highly charged and energetic ions our direction. Lunar regolith, the dusty material that covers the surface of the moon, is a very abrasive material. It's as fine as a powder with extremely small particles, but as, bra as abrasive as glass and gets all over your gear and into your module or spacecraft. Apollo astronaut Harrison Schmidt described the reaction he had to the presence of lunar dust particles in the module as lunar hay fever. And for some astronauts, the effects lasted well after their return to Earth. Now, let's ponder the journey to Mars. While it takes around three days to get to the moon, a crewed mission would take around nine months to reach Mars. Because humans have yet to make this journey, we look to humans who worked in comparable environments, along with computer models, to make educated predictions of the challenges that any future crew traveling to Mars will face. Based on data collected by a Mars science lab while traveling from Earth to Mars, the crew will likely be exposed to around 0.66 sieverts of radiation, primarily from cosmic rays and other ionizing radiation. This may not sound like much, but it's around 15 times the annual limit allowed for radiological workers on Earth, and nearly the maximum amount of radiation allowed for an astronaut's career, which is one sievert in total. An unexpected solar flare could lead to an even higher level of exposure to harmful radiation. As mentioned before, the weightless environment leads to muscle and bone atrophy, and the immune system grows increasingly dysfunctional. Another hazard of spending a long time in space is the deformation of the shape of one's eyes that come from prolonged change in the distribution of body fluid. Over time, the absence of gravity, the spine elongates, making it more susceptible to injury. It takes time for the spine to reposition and become stable again, which will be challenging for astronauts that are required to be able to walk, let alone carry heavy payloads, once they arrive on the surface of Mars. Perhaps the greatest risk to the crew, and the one we're least able to predict, is the effect of isolation and confinement in a small space with limited resources for a long time. Since it takes up to 20 minutes each way for a message to move from Earth to Mars, the crew will be on their own and need to be able to work together to solve any problems that arise independently. But the reward of setting foot on the surface of another planet in our solar system just might be worth all that risk. So. Proceed. There you go. I'd like to leave you with a final thought. Momentito. <laughs> <laughs>